kitchen. And of course, these windows couldn't be blessed with a better view as we look out at San Francisco Bay with maybe 12 knots, 13 knots of breeze, looking as pretty as ever. Uh, let's see, everybody knows that Transpac is happening right now, and we have a couple of members who are doing really well on it, and these days, there's a Transpac viewer, so if you just go in any browser and you type in Transpac 219 viewer, uh, you'll see the viewer for the Transpac, all the boats which were just on the screen, we we're showing just uh, here in the grill room, so you can monitor all of the, all the boats that are competing. Uh, Comanche, all the boats that started last, but which go like crazy are already, the trimarans are already in front of the whole pack. A little bit about future speakers. Um, Michael Ellis, the noted naturalist, will be here in December to talk all about um, the uh, Mojave Desert, of all things. It was once a lake. He'll be talking about the once Mojave Lake. Uh, also in December, uh, Guggenhagen will be here to talk all about Japan's top secret submarine plan to win World War II. So he's uh, written all about this, and he'll tell all about it. There really was a submarine net in San Francisco Bay. He'll talk about that, too. Um, let's see. Also in October, get a little bit of feedback, Eric. Um, you want to come by again in October. So Anna Marie Schulte will be here to talk about Sparrowhawk on the Horizon. Sparrowhawk as in the Yacht America, the 90-foot on the waterline yacht, which revolutionized everything when she got to England and beat everybody sailing around the Isle of Wight. Um, also in uh, September, Michael Brodsky will be here. He was the lawyer behind Save the California Delta. He'll be here to talk about how they stopped the giant sucking sound we would have had if two big tunnels had been used to suck water around the Delta down to Southern California. And uh, here present as well, and we'll be speaking in se middle of September, Mort Beebe, the noted photographer, just back from his trip to um, China. So Mort, we'll have, we look forward to you speaking. Wave your hand out here, Mort. Wave a hand. There we go. Mort will be here to talk about China. And his, he's written several books, beautiful photographic books. Uh, September 11, Susan Rooney and Graham Beale will be here to talk about the Big Boat series. From their view, she the PRO, he the race manager. Um, you're wondering what's happening in the Transpac. Well, Chip Merlin, who bought the yacht Merlin, he had the name first. He'll be here to talk all about having raced to Hawaii in Merlin. Um, and at the end, in August 21st, Tracy Edwards, the skipper of the yacht Maiden that's in the, new, in the uh, movie uh, houses these days, she'll be here to talk about what it was like to skipper the first women crew in, their, in a around the world race. Uh, George Jacob will be here uh, August 14th to talk about the Equitarium. It's kind of like an aquarium, kind of like an ecosystem. Um, Art Garfunkel will be here uh, earlier in August to talk about the making of a bar pilot. Uh, and end of July, uh, Kathy Miller and Don Natoli, those are two politicians in Sacramento who told you, who will talk about how they leg legislatively stopped the big sucking sound that would have bypassed the California Bay. And next week, the 24th of July, it takes confidence to be on the water right now and say you're going to be back here on July 24th to tell us how the Transpac was won. But who other than Stan Honey will be back and be our speaker next week to talk about what it was like to be on Comanche, which is currently about third overall heading that way and, and uh, you know, among the last boats to start. So um, well, we have great speakers lined up. A little bit about our speaker today. So imagine being four years of age and, um, you know, zipping around in a little 18-foot zodiac and being fascinated by looking at penguins. You don't know it for what you're going to do as an adult. And he just remembers being completely fascinated. He had the great fortune to be in Chile, where you get lots of penguin views, more than in San Francisco Bay. Next view, when you think about notable things as an eight-year-old, he remembers being on this 30-foot um, catamaran and diving with his family and seeing his first coral reef and being dazzled by the whole idea about coral reefs and how beautiful they were. By age 12, he was diving and swimming with dolphins and porpoises and sharks and uh, hanging out with his folks on a 40-foot powerboat. At age 15, he was certified scuba diver, snorkeling all over the place, again, completely fascinated by life under the sea. 
he decides to go to Hawaii to, to go to high school in Miami and um, spear, spear fishes and motorboats all through his high school days. Goes to Georgetown where he gets a Bachelor of Science in Science, Technology and International Affairs. And he put that to good use. He's currently an Oceans Associate at the California Environmental Association. He's also, though he's a youngster, he's also on the board of directors of the Ocean Film Festival and the uh, Marine Conservation International. And he's basically concerned about what he can do to preserve the environment as seen from the view of the oceans. And we need custodians who will help us save our oceans. So with that, please um, welcome up Sebastian Nichols. Sebastian. Thank you, Ron, for that fantastic interaction. I, um, you know, unfortunately haven't been a sailor yet. I was telling a few of the guests here, but hopefully we'll get there. And I prepared a presentation to talk about what makes me passionate about the ocean. I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of what's happening from underwater, from being on boats, from living internationally. I've lived in, in seven countries and have gotten to know marine ecosystems all around. And so I wanted to share a little bit about human interactions with the ocean on the environmental front. I don't know as much about the history of sailing, but I think um, I can share a little bit about how we've interacted with the ocean in the past through the present, where we are now, and what we need to do to achieve this vision. As Ron mentioned, that's my passion, which is trying to save the ocean from the threats that it faces currently. So fantastic to be here. Um, when Ron asked me to, to give this speech, I was thinking, where to start, right? I have this passion. We all are here. Uh, because we love the ocean in different ways, you guys got to sail and be out on the surface for a lot. So I thought I'd start the presentation framing this kind of fact. You know, why are we here? Why are we here not just at the San Francisco Yacht Club as ocean enthusiasts and sailors, but why are we here at all as a species, as life on Earth? And all of life on Earth is made possible because of the ocean. So I was speaking with a couple of the members here uh, as I was getting started, and um, one of them mentioned that being out in the open ocean, he realized for the first time, this is really what the planet is. And all of the ast astronauts that have been in space had the same ob observation. You know, the, the um, Earth looks blue from space. It's because of the ocean. Um, it's that ocean that makes life possible. And I wanted to just share this quote from one of the astronauts that went on Apollo missions about what he saw from space. He called it a sparkling, sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising gradually like small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. It's a beautiful image of what the Earth really looks like from space. And all of us know this famous image, um, Earth Rise, um, taken from the moon. And you can see just from that perspective how blue this planet we call Earth is. Um, Arthur Clarke, a, a British um, science fiction writer, has this great quote of how ironic that we call this planet Earth when it is so clearly ocean. <laughs> and the ocean's really what, what makes it all possible, right? This picture is from the perspective of the moon. In the moon, the difference in temperature between where sunlight hits and shade is 540 degrees Fahrenheit. Here on this planet, we have an atmosphere and primarily the ocean that keeps the climate more stable. You think of a planet without the ocean and Mars comes to mind. Mars has an atmosphere, so the difference is a little bit smaller, but it's still over 100 degrees Fahrenheit difference between sun and shade. And that would just make life impossible. This kind of tempering effect that the ocean has is made possible by the circulation that's driven by winds, currents, differences in temperature. And it's fascinating to look at what that's like. So these currents distribute temperature around the entire planet, distribute nutrients, uh, allow marine species to traverse great distances, and make climate stable and beautiful, bring us some of these sunny days, bring us some of the fog that we know in San Francisco. Um, so 
you can see just how complex these systems are. In the ocean, it's not just the physical movement of water and nutrients and different um, substances that are dissolved there, but also the interaction between biological systems, geological systems, and chemistry. Um, we call it ocean biogeochemistry that makes uh, a lot of what we see on, on our planet possible. And few people know this, but the ocean's actually also responsible for much of the oxygen production on the planet. How many of you have heard of Prochlorococcus? None of you, right? <laughs> we, got, we got one in the room. So this is a, a type of bacteria that was discovered in 1989. It's these beautiful green um, dots that you can see on the screen. Um, they're about the size of one, one one hundredth the width of a human hair. But this specific type of bacteria is responsible for 20% of the ocean production, of the oxygen production on the planet. Every five breaths, that entire breath is made possible just by this one bacteria. And we know so little about the ocean, right? We didn't know this existed just 30 years ago, but it plays such a critical role. Ocean also has this important function that I mentioned before of tempering the actual temperature of the planet. If we look at temperature anomalies in the ocean since the 1900s, here is an image from a New York Times article. The ocean has absorbed a lot of heat since that time. And I'll get into this a little bit later, but the fact that the ocean's absorbing that heat makes our climate a lot more livable when we're dealing with the threats like climate change um, that impact the Earth's systems. This is estimated heat accumulation on the planet overall. The kind of large blue uh, segment of that is how much of the excess heat energy because of climate change has been stored and, you know, uh, is in the ocean. So the ocean has acted as this huge buffer preventing large temperature changes from affecting our lives and the lives of uh, many animals on the planet. Based on kind of these assumptions of the different energy content of the ocean versus land and atmosphere, scientists uh, project that without the ocean, the air temperature would be 60 degrees warmer from the excess heat from global warming. So the ocean is making it possible for us to still have livable temperatures, not be uh, dying from, from heat exhaustion all the time. And the oceans are not just important for the biogeochemistry and how they temper it the global climate, but also for food security. Uh, an estimated 4.3 billion people depend on the ocean for 15% or more of their animal protein intake. So it's really important for the nutrition, health, and food security. And that number, 4.3 billion people, is almost 60% of the planet. So we really all depend on it uh, very deeply. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us enjoy seafood, enjoy being out on the water and being able to catch wild-caught fish. Um, it's a huge food provisioning system for the entire planet. But even though the oceans have this outsized importance on the planet's climate system, on our food security, on making life possible, we don't know that much about them. This map shows kind of roughly the ocean bottom all around the world, but most of the ocean bottom that has been mapped is only mapped to a resolution of about five kilometers. So think about that a resolution of five kilometers map of San Francisco won't be very useful to you, right? You won't be able to figure out where you're going, where you are. Uh, but in the ocean, we have that low level of resolution. We have better maps of Mars and the moon and other solid planets in our solar system than the ocean itself. And this kind of sparsity of explorations really start when we think about how many people have we sent out into space and how many people have been to the deep ocean. There's almost 600 astronauts that have made it out to space uh, from national missions and recently some private, uh, private flights into space, but only six people total have been to the deepest spot in the ocean, the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. So that's pretty, pretty surprising and crazy that we haven't gotten to know our full planet before going out and exploring the rest of the system. So that's kind of, you know, a brief overview of the ocean. I figured it'd be useful to contextualize this by also showing some of the history of human-ocean interactions, 
uh, in terms of uh, how we've impacted the marine environment. So the ocean has this huge importance and we've been interacting with it for a while. About 130,000 years ago there was the first evidence of human seafaring from you know, our archaeologists finding tools that looked like they were used to build boats, to steer, to navigate. 90,000 years ago there's the first archaeological evidence of fishing tools in the uh, eastern Pacific. And more recently there's been a lot of technological changes in how we interact with the ocean, what we're extracting from it. So only, it was only about 200 BC when the first barbed hook that we know about uh, was used, that was in the Nile. And since then it's been a pretty fast uh, change in pace in terms of how we're interacting environmentally with the ocean. In uh, 875, only about uh, 1,200 years before now, was the start of commercial whaling, um, extracting whales from the ocean. In 1497, an explorer called John Cabot came over to the Americas from Europe, sailing across the Atlantic. At that time, he hit up against the coast of New England and described endless schools of cod of a thickness that you had never seen before and that it looked so abundant that he thought you could almost walk on the water on the backs of these massive schools of cod. Since then, we've gotten very good at exploring and reaching further into the ocean, but also taking more out of it. And so in recent history, the story of our interactions with the marine environment have been more a story of loss. Um, this, these images here are a few of the animals that we started extracting and very quickly uh, led to their complete demise, extinction, the top uh, left, the middle top, and the bottom left are all animals that went extinct shortly after they were discovered by uh, Europeans. <laughs> um, some of these were, were in the Americas before then, they didn't have much threats. And on the right side we have bluefin tuna, um, which are now at about 3% of the levels that they had before extraction and the oceanic white tip shark, which was the most abundant predator in the ocean until about 1990 and since then has gone down to less than 10% of its uh, historical population. So it's been a story of very fast impact. Some of these animals that I showed, the stellar sea cow that was on the top left on the previous slide, uh, it was discovered by Europeans only in 1741 and 27 years later the last one was seen. It went extinct very quickly. The sea mink uh, which was uh, like a sea otter but native to Maine and New England uh, went extinct in, 19, in 1894. Uh, the monk seal over here on the bottom left uh, of the Caribbean. Um, there used to be populations of estimated 233,000 to 340,000 before, you know, before Europeans were having a lot of impact on the Caribbean uh, in the 1800s. By 1952 the last one was seen. So there's been, there's been a lot of loss in the ocean. What we're projecting if we don't change course is that by 2050 there will be an ice-free Arctic in the summer, which may be fun for sailing up there, uh, but not great in terms of the Earth's climate systems. And if we continue on the trends that we have now, there will be more plastics than fish in the ocean by weight, and likely uh, coral reefs and other essential ocean habitats might be extinct if we don't change course fast. So this is what gives me purpose and meaning each day as I come to work and try to help uh, work to solve these problems and um, I hope you know it infuses in you the, the urgency of this problem and the need for us all to get involved to help combat it. Uh, in terms of the impact that we have on the ocean, I thought it would be interesting to show this slide. There's been recent advances in satellite technology that allow us to see where fishing is happening in real time and an analysis of all this fishing data showed that globally, more than 50% of the oceans by surface area are being fished. Right? So there are very few safe places where uh, the habitats are safe, the fish are safe, the dolphins are safe in the ocean and can recover and replenish. And the story of loss in fisheries is somewhat um, less known than some of the other impacts that we have currently like plastics because the baselines have changed. Uh, in our lifetimes we haven't seen the change in abundance, the change in size in fish. But one researcher in Florida was able to find images taken at the same landing dock throughout decades 
and compare the size of the fish that anglers would come back with to, you know, extrapolate the abundance and size of fish. So these are pictures taken, both of them in the 1950s in uh, the Florida Keys. There's goliath groupers that are larger than most of the people in the pictures and huge numbers of them, right? These fishermen just couldn't catch enough. By the 2000s, this is the same landing dock and this is the average size of the fish that they're getting over there. Quite a stark reduction, right? And besides overfishing, there's also other impacts. Um, nutrient pollution from sewage, from agricultural runoff goes in, off into the ocean and causes a large algal growth and then that algae to decompose that takes out all the oxygen from certain areas. So these red hotspots here are areas where there's no oxygen uh, in the water. So any fish that are traversing through those end up dying because they don't have oxygen. It has a lot of ecological impacts. And they're largely concentrated around where the population centers are because that's where there's the biggest impact of the nutrients going into the ocean. Um, and these have been growing in recent years. And finally, as I'm sure all of you have seen sailing out in the open ocean in the bay, there's a lot of plastic going in. Um, every minute, about a truckload, equivalent of a truckload full of plastic, goes into the ocean from runoff from rivers, from falling directly into it. You know, it's uh, going into the ocean at a very fast pace, and we haven't reduced our production of plastic yet. So it's causing, uh, causing many environmental issues. Overall in the ocean, I showed how much of the ocean is fished. I thought it'd be interesting to show how much of the ocean is truly protected. Where are we actually creating spaces for life to be able to thrive, to restore the abundance there once was? On land, since the creation of national parks in the US and this idea of protecting places, um, on land globally, we've protected about 17% of the land surface area coverage. In the ocean, we've only really truly protected about 2.2% by surface area. So there's a lot of work for us to do to create safe spaces uh, in the water where life can thrive, where we can replenish some of the abundance that once was there and also restore the services that the ocean's giving, oxygen production, regulating climate, creating abundance, food provisioning, all of these depend on healthy ecosystems that are operating at their maximum potential. And by protecting more of the ocean, we can help get us there. So another uh, impact that's going on in the ocean that's less well known is ocean acidification. Um, as CO2 goes into the atmosphere and then ends up getting absorbed into the ocean, it creates carbonic acid and that acid uh, it, it increases the, the pH of the water, decreases the pH of the water, makes it more acidic. That higher acidity is a huge threat to calcifying organisms, organisms that build shells uh, from the bacteria that I was showing in the beginning that has a small silicate shell, to shellfish, corals, all these animals that form a really important part of the base of the marine food chain. And finally, the temperature increases in the ocean. It's great that we have the ocean as a buffer to keep our climate kind of stable and livable, but that absorption of heat into the ocean also has an impact on its viability. As the ocean temperature increases, the amount of oxygen that can dissolve in water decreases. So this higher temperature is causing deoxygenation of a lot of areas of the ocean. And with that higher temperature, there's also ecosystem-specific impacts. This is here a, a coral specimen. You can see living in there, there's a few different fish that depend on healthy coral for their habitat. You know, they have this kind of symbiotic relationship where the fish protect the coral, the coral protects the fish. And it's beautiful when it's thriving and colorful and, and alive. But because of higher temperatures, more and more of the coral around the world is looking like this. The foreground of this picture is coral that has bleached. Uh, coral is an animal that has a symbiotic relationship with algae that lives inside of it to provide most of its food. When the temperature increases, the animal part of it gets stressed out and kicks out the algae uh, and becomes this white color. The white color that you're seeing is transparent flesh with the limestone skeleton underneath. If it stays stressed like that for too long, 
kind of like one of us having a, a 101 degree fever for an extended period of time, you know, weeks or months, it ends up dying and um, gets covered up in algae in the back, and that's what we see in this picture. And when the coral dies, the fish that call it home also move away, right? That is, that is their home, that is, they depend on live coral to have habitat and be able to survive. So without the coral, some of the abundance uh, also leaves. This is a, a localized graph of coral decline in a Caribbean reef, but it's largely representative of what has happened around the world. In the past uh, 10, 15 years, there's been huge coral bleaching events that in the Great Barrier Reef uh, resulted in us losing 30 to 50% of the coral that was there. And around the world, this is uh, unfortunately a trend where coral is um, threatened by warming temperatures, by changing ecosystem dynamics because of overfishing and other threats. And so it's really a, a dire situation. We're facing a reality where by 2050, there could be very few coral reefs left around the planet. And then there's places that, are, that were once beautiful and thriving but now aren't so much so. Part of my story is that I was able to live in Brazil in 2006 to 2008 and lived in Rio over there. One of the things that um, got me more passionate about ocean conservation from living there is seeing Guanabara Bay, which now looks like this. Um, it had bothered me for a while that it's overrun with kind of garbage and, and sewage and all this terrible pollution. And I hadn't thought about it that much until two years after moving to Rio, I was sitting in a restaurant one day and see this painting off on the wall of a beautiful bay full of dolphins, whales, turtles, all this wildlife. So I went up to the painting to take a look at where this was because I wanted to visit and see a place that was so abundant. I read the label and it was the same bay in the 1600s. It used to be one of these places where these uh, southern right whales were really abundant and there were thousands of dolphins until the 1970s and we were able to have such a big impact in such a short time that it really made me wake up to the reality of what we're facing and the need for us to do more. But, you know, we have this tremendous capacity to impact ecosystems and that impact can be as positive uh, as the negative impact that we've had. We know and have the policy tools and the ideas for what can save the ocean and have actually been quite successful with a few of these initiatives. Pictured here is a humpback whale that if you guys sail out here in the bay, you'll see pretty frequently in the summer. Humpback whales we almost hunted to extinction. And in the past 50 years or so, after the ban on commercial whaling, their populations have recovered extraordinarily, right? It uh, seems like rocket science to some people that don't understand environmental conservation, but if you don't kill things, they take longer to die, they reproduce more, and they become more abundant. The graph on the uh, right side of this slide shows that increase of population that we've had since 1978. Just before then was the ban on commercial whaling, and it's just trended up tremendously, and it's so beautiful to see these animals abundant and lively in the ocean. In terms of protection, we're also trending up very well. There's a lot more for us to do, but in the past 15 years, we've protected more of the ocean than in all history prior. And if we continue on those trends, there's a chance that we can restore enough so that life uh, in the oceans can continue to thrive and uh, have greater resilience to climate change. So pretty exciting to see the number of marine protected areas and the total area that's covered grow exponentially over the past 10, 15 years. And even though there's been loss, there's still places that have this beautiful abundance. I took this picture in May of this year, I went diving in the Red Sea. And in the Red Sea, the currents bring in cold water, so the coral's still thriving. It's this beautiful kaleidoscopic colors. Uh, you have fish that have really bright yellows, bright reds, bright blues, beautiful abundance, and really heartening to see that there's still places that are, that are worth saving, that are worth going to, that hold this amazing beauty and, and resilience for us. And besides that, what gives me the most hope is that more and more people are getting engaged and learning about what's going on and doing more. 
um, to save the ocean. So I'm excited to be able to share this message with you guys and invite everyone here to um, get involved. There's fantastic organizations in the Bay Area that are doing great work uh, to support um, ocean conservation. Uh, two of those that I'm involved with and do a lot of events are Marine Conservation Institute up in Sonoma. They're working on this marine protection, how to increase protection of the oceans globally. And the International Ocean Film Festival is uh, a great organization too. We have a lot of films talking about these issues, engage our audience, and are working on more impact initiatives. In your own lives, there's many things that you can do from considering you know, whether the fish you eat was farmed sustainably, reduce your carbon footprint through you know, using bikes more often, transportation, using uh, planes and flights less often, support the creation of marine protected areas. And you know, for politicians, it's a risk to create a marine protected area because the fishermen that lose access will be a lot more vocal than the rest of us that are reaping the benefits of having more abundance and thriving ecosystems. But if we have enough pressure from the population, the politicians will follow and create more of these protected areas. Share the message of why the ocean is important to us, to our planet, to you personally, and get more people involved um, to support the initiatives that we need. With everybody's involvement and, uh, and passion for this, it's possible for us to save the ocean. We know we have the tools to be able to do it. We just need more pressure, more support, and a, a groundswell so that we change the tide. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll go over for a Q&A shortly. Our speaker today is Ocean's Associate Sebastian Nichols. Um, Sebastian, give us a sense. Um, do you have the, are you aware of the economic impact of food production from the oceans? What's the, how much dollars worth of food comes out of the ocean every year? In terms of fisheries, uh, purely fish production, there's some new industries coming up around uh, kelp and algae farming, and I'm not sure about those numbers. But fisheries represent at least 50 to $150 billion each year. There's been estimates also about all the other ancillary benefits that the ocean provides in terms of stabilizing the climate, um, you know, tourism, the healthy oceans draw more people to visit them and bring in tourism dollars to those places. And the estimates of the o overall value of the ocean economy, including fisheries as a part of it, is $24 trillion annually. Uh, World Wildlife Fund did that projection. So it's really a huge, <coughs> huge driver of value. We just don't necessarily consider that value in the same ways that we do uh, other economic activities like fishing and extraction that are appropriable. Is that economic activity growing or shrinking? Which is it? The economic activity, I think, is growing. That is, is to say growing. fishing for food and getting food by every means. So what's happened is that there's been tremendous technological advances in the ways that we can get further into the ocean, deeper to extract fish. Um, but we've taken so much that it's, it's hard to take more. So there's increasing fishing effort. Um, there's too much money chasing too few fish. But the actual output of how many fish they catch remains stable. So we're spending more money going out further, using bigger ships, using bigger nets, but catching the same amount of fish because we haven't allowed uh, the species, the spaces to recover and uh, manage the stocks you know, sustainably so that they can actually begin on their upward trend. What was that process you called photorococcus? Would you pronounce it? I didn't. Prochlorococcus. Yeah, it's so what is, what is it? Mechanically, what is it? How does it work? Um, it photo photosynthesizes. So it will take nutrients from the water, uh, CO2 that's dissolved in the water, and water molecules, split the hydrogen off from the water, and uh, take out uh, oxygen comes out on the other end. That oxygen is initially dissolved in seawater because this bacteria lives in the seawater. But with mixing and, and different dynamic processes, the oxygen un, ends up coming up in the atmosphere. And that one type of bacteria creates 20% of the oxygen that we breathe. So now you said that the ocean's keeping the planet cool. Uh, how, what are the mechanics of how the ocean, how water keeps the planet cooler? Yeah. 
the, um, the, the, the amount of energy taken to heat a gram of water one degree Celsius is thousands of times more than it takes to heat the atmosphere, you know, the, the same amount of atmosphere one degree Celsius. Because water is denser. Because water is denser because it has certain properties. It's a polar molecule. So um, what happens is that the energy ends up getting absorbed into the ocean. The ocean has a smaller temperature increase, but by absorbing that heat, it prevents it from going out into the atmosphere and on land and allows the atmosphere to remain cooler even though there's a lot more excess energy because of climate change. So I can see how that can be absorbing heat, but at some point it isn't getting rid of the heat, it isn't dissipating, it's just absorbing and absorbing. And the size of the water means that it can absorb lots of heat coming off the land. Um, what is happening to cool the oceans? What, is there any other countervailing forces? Right. Uh, so there's, uh, there's deep ocean currents where the water is cooler down, and that movement of water allows it to maintain a more uniform temperature. Of course, they're warming overall. One of the impacts that I didn't get to talking about is that the increase in temperature of the water actually is one of the drivers of sea level rise. So w when water increases in temperature, it takes up a little bit more volume. On small scales, like a cup of water, you won't notice, but on the scale of the ocean, it's so big that it causes the sea level to rise. And here in San Francisco, we'll be at risk of some of that impact from the thermal expansion of water. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions until I see some from the audience, one of which has surfaced. John Bechtel has a question. John. You mentioned that the only recently the most abundant organism in seawater was discovered. Does can you comment on that, and that, does that predict uh, a crescendo of activity in ocean, ocean, of, ocean biology? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's symptomatic of how little we've explored the ocean, that we didn't know this one organism that's one of the most abundant organisms on the planet is there until only 30 years ago. We've still only explored about 5% of the ocean, so we have a lot more to learn. I think there's increased attention now but not enough when we compare it to the budgets that we spend on space exploration and other initiatives. We really don't know enough about the ocean. Um, there's some deep diving submersibles, manned and unmanned, that are going into deep waters to find out what's there. And almost every mission that goes below 1,000 feet ends up finding new species every time. So there's a lot more for us to learn. Um, I think it's increasing a little bit, but not at the pace that we should to really understand this critical part of our planet's living system. Other than your own, what other international organizations are you, do you admire for what good work they're doing in the oceans? Yeah, there, there's a lot of fantastic organizations. Um, Mission Blue is one that works to get people to support hope spots that can become protected areas in their communities. Um, Oceana, the Ocean Conservancy, Conservation International, uh, World Wildlife Fund all do a lot of important work around the world on everything from fisheries to creating more marine protected areas to um, educating and involving communities so that they value the ocean and, uh, and become stewards of the ocean the way that they should be. And just here in the Bay Area, there's some great foundations doing oceans work. Uh, the Packard Foundation supports initiatives all around the world the Moore Foundation, and many others that uh, are escaping my mind right now. But there's really a great coalition of foundations, NGOs, individuals, and even some companies that are helping support more sustainable use of the and, ocean. And that is my next question. What companies are doing a good job of helping preserve the ocean? Yeah. There's a, there's a few companies that are working on innovative finance models. I think um, Willis Towers Watson and AXA Insurance uh, that are European based have worked on some uh, innovative models like actually creating an insurance policy for a coral reef. So the insurance helps keep it healthy and make sure that it stays there and provides the benefits to the local population and coastline that are needed. Um, so those are some good ones. In uh, the Bay Area, um, of course, there's uh, Salesforce has a, has a foundation that supports a lot of ocean initiatives. Um, and there's uh, companies from seafood companies that are working on, on improving their impact uh, to retailers like Walmart that have actually made commitments uh, for all of their seafood to be sourced sustainably in the next 10, 15 years. 
What countries do you admire for the work they're doing to preserve the oceans? I think Chile comes to mind as, as, a, as a particularly salient example. Um, Chile has a very small slice of land area and their area of ocean jurisdiction is much bigger than their land, but they've really capitalized that and protected that well. So Chile um, has protected 40% of their total ocean jurisdiction in protected areas. It's really a, a huge commitment and much bigger than where most of the world is. Palau in the eastern tropical Pacific has uh, made a commitment that in 2020 they're going to create a protected area over 80% of their entire um, ocean jurisdiction. So there's a lot of, a lot of great examples out there, uh, many of them coming from small island developing states and the developing world that show us we really can do this if we set our minds to it. We just need to push harder and put more pressure to make it happen. Uh, another question from the audience, Jim Hancock, founder of the Science Sailing Center. Jim. Yeah, Sebastian, first of all, that was a terrific presentation. And yes, thank you have for to say that. thanks again. Thank um, you. I, w I was particularly struck by your astronaut and aquanaut slide. Um, that, I mean, that, that, that'll stick with me. That's, that's quite a contrast. But my question goes back to uh, when I was in graduate school and I took a, a class on environmental chemistry. What we did in that class is we went through all these different pollutants that came into the environment and calculated through chemical reactions what the half-lives would be um, through the, the various systems that removed those pollutants from, from the uh, environment, such as the carbonate system in the ocean and so forth. And what my big takeaway, even though they didn't intentionally try to teach us this, my big takeaway from the class was that if we stopped polluting, if we stopped introducing the pollutants into the environment tomorrow, the atmosphere and the ocean would clean themselves up actually pretty quickly. Most things would be taken care of within a matter of months and some would, you know, within a year or two with one really major exception and that was uh, nuclear waste, yeah. right, which the half-lives of those things will be around literally for thousands of years. And, you know, with the accident at Fukushima, um, of course, that came to mind. And I was wondering if you had any comments about that and what the effects might be of that kind of uh, pollution on the ocean. Sure. Thank you for your question, um, Jim. That's a fantastic question. I'm not an expert on the impacts of radioactive material on the marine environment, um, so I'm not the best person to answer that. What I will say is, while Fukushima is a very salient example in our memory, there are kind of worse things that we've done. Um, for a while, the United States military and other countries, what they do to get rid of uh, nuclear waste is just dump it in barrels into the ocean. So there's a lot of uh, pollution out there, and I think that the short answer is we know that it can likely have negative impacts. Um, we don't know what all of those are in part because we haven't done enough science and exploration of the ocean. But we also know that if places are taken care of properly, they can recover from those impacts. So um, in Bikini Atoll, there were nuclear tests in the, I think, 1960s that the U.S. was running, you know, exploding hydrogen bombs, destroying the island. Um, and it, but it's very remote and fishing boats aren't going there. And a few expeditions have gone recently with members of the, the Cousteau uh, family exploring that place. And what they found was actually the abundance of sharks, of turtles, of uh, dolphins, of large predatory fish is much higher than in other ecosystems. So when it's actually protected, it's resilient and can recover. And, you know, these ocean currents help spread around the pollutants and kind of clean them up. So the impacts long term, if we do the other right things to protect and conserve these places, can actually be mitigated pretty well. So with the next question, we get to acknowledge a significant contributor to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, and that is to say the Vice Chair, Kathy Trafton. Kathy, you have a question. I do. Sebastian, thank you for your wonderful presentation. You mentioned something about the biomass, and I'm curious about the biomass, how much is in the ocean now compared to times past. And in an ancillary question, you mentioned if you must eat fish, how do you do it sustainably? 
I have an app on my phone. It's called Seafood Watch out of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Is that the best way to find out what fishes are sustainable? Yeah, uh, great, great question. Qu <laughs> great question, Kathy. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, in terms of total biomass, I think, again, one of the problems is um, I'm not a, a, a full expert on it, and there's also hasn't been enough exploration and science of the ocean to answer that fully. But fish biomass, we have some good projections based on what we think the baseline was pre-industrial levels and how much we've taken out since. And those estimates are that we're at about 10% of the fish biomass that once existed in the ocean. So we've taken up out about 90%. Uh, there's a lower number of fish in the ocean now, and their size on average is smaller because we're taking them out before they have the chance to grow and mature. Um, so it's a really big problem, but luckily there are solutions out there to help all of us make uh, more responsible choices. And Seafood Watch is a great example. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has been doing a lot of great uh, sustainable seafood initiatives. Uh, the app will tell you kind of what's the best choice for sustainability, what's le less recommended, what's definitely not sustainable. So you can help avoid and consume more sustainably when you do eat seafood using that app. And it's a great tool recommended to everyone to check it out. So, uh, and just before I uh, have the next question from the audience, we should recognize that the questioner's uh, nephew is here, just back from the transatlantic um, race. Mark Darcy, stand up, mate. Uh, basically, first in class, second overall, 20 boats in the transatlantic race. Good going, Mark. Mark was the navig Mark was the navigator. Uh, if you ever had a navigator, you know that they're all navigators. He's a good navigator, very, very good navigator. And uh, Uncle Bruce Monroe always has a thoughtful question. Staff commenter, what's your question, sir? Okay, a follow-up question on fish sustainability. I've done a lot of cruising in the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, Alaska. In British Columbia, you see fish farms a lot, all over the place. Cross the border into Alaska, none, because they're outlawed. I wonder what your opinion is on fish farming as a way to reduce the pressure on the wild fish. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking great that. Question. I think fish farming has the potential to reduce the impact on uh, wild caught fisheries and be more sustainable if it's done right. But currently the way that it's done in, in Canada, for example, you have these fish farms that are in small channels where a lot of the wild salmon pass through and this large concentration of fish in the fish farms creates a breeding ground for bacteria, sea lice, other infections that affect the fish in the farms. And since a lot of the wild salmon are passing through these narrow channels where the fish farms are, they get infected and impacted, and it decimates the wild population as well. Um, I think the other problem with aquaculture is a lot of the times there's these fish farms set up, but the fish feed uh, used to feed the fish in the farms is another species caught unsustainably out in the ocean. So there are better models out there. Um, one of the big ideas, I think, is integrated multitrophic aquaculture. What that means is integrating a fish farm with algae down the line and shellfish that filter the water so you end up using all the not nutrients and that doesn't um, impact the, the water column negatively around them. But there's a lot more that we need to advance before aquaculture is fully sustainable. There's better examples and worse examples. Um, but it's one of the things that done right can really help. Um, unfortunately, it's not there currently. Our next question is from uh, a buddy I've raced against and who once held the world sailing speed record, Russell Long. What's your question, buddy? Sebastian, uh, thanks for the great work you're doing. Um, I had an environmental organization named Blue Water Network until about 10 years ago that I merged into Friends of the Earth. So I've got a long background in this as well. And since that time, I, I've been watching as the plastic issue has just exploded. <clears throat> so we're reading now that we're winding up with small amounts of plastic and fish that are winding up on our table. Um, but there's been some progress. The EU, as you probably know, passed 
legislation recently that looks like it's going to limit plastic use and create a, a recycling loop. Uh, and we have a bill here in California now, I think it's SB 54, that will reduce plastic by 75% in the next 11 years or so. Yeah. My question is, I'm also reading that Asia is far worse than the EU and the US, and obviously China and other Asian nations. Is anybody doing anything to try to stop that in Asia because you know, we can do whatever we want here, we can do everything we can in Europe, but until Asia starts reining it in, we're going to have much worse problems ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's, that's another fantastic question, really. Um, that's, you, you got it exactly right. I mean, obviously you've spent time on this. Um, the Ocean Conservancy did an analysis a few years ago that showed that the vast majority of plastic pollution in the ocean comes from just eight countries, and most of those are in Southeast Asia. Uh, the challenges there are not just, you know, that, the, that there aren't great waste management systems, but there's weak governance. It's difficult to get to these places, and uh, some of them are uh, countries like Indonesia, where simply because it's many islands, it, it, you know, there's a very quick uh, downstream flow from garbage getting out anywhere to flowing down into the ocean. Um, it's challenging to to address that. The good news is that more and more of these countries are thinking about how to manage their waste and reduce the influx into the ocean. So in Indonesia, there's a few islands uh, within Indonesia that have banned plastic bags and are working on some other single-use plastic bans following the, the model from the European Union and Canada that passed the law recently to ban single-use plastics. And there's more engagement from the NGO community and foundations in these big impact countries to support the development of integrated waste management systems, circular economy loops, and passing policy that helps mitigate the impact. So there's some work being done. There's a lot more to do. Um, but there's hope there that other groups are starting to focus on the main sources of plastic pollution into the ocean and working heavily to, uh, to push the solutions. A quick uh, recap of something you mentioned earlier. So how are coral reefs formed? Uh, how are they dying? And can they be restored? Sure. So uh, coral reefs form. Um, Corals, many people think of them as plants because they're, they're static. They have a, a limestone skeleton, so they stay in the same place and grow basically on rocks and are rooted there. But they're actually animal organisms. So uh, corals are colonies of polyps that are like little jellyfish that stick out tentacles into the water and, and eat particles. But they also have a symbiotic relationship with algae that live inside their tissues that photosynthesizes and provides much of their food. The, one of the main threats to coral reefs worldwide is that the ocean temperatures are increasing. As they increase, these animals get stressed out, and when they're stressed out, they kick out the algae that they depend on for food from their tissues. If they're stressed out for too long, they'll starve to death, basically, without the algae, and, uh, and then get smothered in, uh, in different particles from the ocean and end up dying. So that's... Uh, what the main threat to corals are. I forgot the second part to your question. Can, when they, after they're dead, can they be restored? After they're dead, Can another animal go inside the coral and rehabilitate it like some seashells? Yeah, um, it's, it's definitely possible. Um, the main problem now is that the ecological balance has shifted. So if a coral dies, then it might get overrun by algae. If a rock is overrun by algae, coral can't repopulate that place. So we need to have places where we've stopped fishing so that the ecological ba balance is restored and there's uh, controls on algae growth so that corals can repopulate it. Um, in places where there has been ocean protection and corals have gone through bleaching events, they've actually recovered spectacularly. So we know that if we create protected areas, if we have better management measures, those places can come back after bleaching events. Um, but not enough of the ocean is protected yet. Is that the old coral uh, being reborn by new animals inside of it, or is that new coral? It's, it's 
new coral, so coral reefs nearby will release their eggs and sperm into the water during certain full moon nights. They have a, a cycle where the same species will all spawn at the same time. And those are just kind of taken by the currents to wherever. Kind of like Mardi Gras? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it sounds just like it, huh? And, and Scientific question. <laughs> But those packets of, uh, of, uh, of, of you know, baby coral that are floating out in the water can only colonize a new place if there's the right substrate, the right rocks, the right space that's not covered in algae. And we need to have healthy habitats, healthy ecosystems, so they can actually find a place to live and do their own Mardi Gras years <laughs> after. We have another question? Yes, there? another question. Hi, I'm Teresa. And, um as human beings, we seem to have a terrible tendency to destroy or exploit anything that we discover and get our hands on. Uh, you know, you think of Mount Everest, of uh, you know this country uh, from its early days, and other parts of the world. Do you have any concerns that the more we explore the deep oceans, the more we will potentially damage it? Or, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It sounds like you advocate that we do it. Uh, do you have any concerns that it will actually be detrimental to those environments? Yeah, I think it depends on the, the character of the exploration. Um, there are people now that are thinking we've mined all the land, we've taken out all the space, the deep ocean is the next place to go to get out minerals and, you know, um, clear cut what coral forests are there and take out whatever chemicals are useful to us. So I don't think, you know, that kind of exploration, of course, would be hugely detrimental. Um, on the other hand, I think part of the reason that the deep ocean hasn't been protected is that we don't know what's there and what value it has that well. Um, if more people got to see these images of corals that live in the deep ocean, some of which are 5,000 years old, the beautiful life that's able to thrive at these depths without any sunlight, just feeding off the ocean currents that pass by um, particles in the water. Um, I think if more people could see that and understand and we can get a sense of how that connects to the rest of the ocean and the Earth's climate, there will be more appreciation and a bigger um, push to protect those places. So I want to take a moment to recognize someone who's doing quite a bit, actually, to uh, help us save the oceans, because she's present with us today, the founder of the Ocean Film Festival, Anna Blanco, is here. Anna, stand up and give a wave. Thank you so much for the good work you do for the Ocean Film Festival. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let's see, are there any, any animals or fish that benefit from pollution or ocean warming? <laughs> that's yeah. That's a really good question. Um, there, there are animals that become more dominant in ecosystems as we shift the ecological balance. Of course, algae that feed on nutrients explode when there's these, uh, you know, agricultural pollution and sewage runoff that goes into the ocean. But it's very short-lived. They have a population expansion, then they all die, decompose, and it creates deoxygenated areas where nothing can live. Um, the other trend is as we've overfished areas, there's a shift in balance and um, animals that can reproduce easily and now have less predators to chase them end up you know, growing in abundance and in their ecological role. So there's projections that if we, if we don't do enough to protect the ocean, it might become a soup dominated by jellyfish instead of having fish and dolphins and manta rays and these magnificent um, megafauna creatures. So there are some animals that might benefit in terms of their population numbers, but the overall ecological balance of the ocean suffers, of course, from these changes. Wait, wait, you used the word, megaphonic creatures. These are not like bullhorns. What, what's a megaphonic creature? Me I mean, a megafauna, just large animals, you know, the whales, the dolphins, the manta rays that can have 16 to 20 foot wingspans. Um, I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of being able to dive with some of these and it's, uh, it, it's amazing to be in the water with them. You can sense that they have a deep intelligence and curiosity for what is this you know, uh, intruder doing in my world and what, what are you about? They'll look you in the eye and pass very close. <laughs> Another question from the audience, Jimmy DeWitt. I had a terrible thought. Um, there's plans to go to the moon and mine the moon and bring the minerals back. 
maybe man will destroy the moon. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, will man destroy the moon? Is that the question, Jim? <laughs> You know, I think uh, I might not be the right person to answer this. I'm not a <laughs> space exploration uh, expert. I think the, the, the biggest lesson for me that I've seen from being able to live in all these different places, dive, see the impacts that we've had, is that we have the ability uh, to destroy anything we want to, but we also have the ability to protect and restore. Um, I didn't share this uh, when I was giving my presentation, but in Rio there's this terrible story of loss from the bay there that's been overrun with sewage and, and plastic pollution. But there's also a parallel story that gives me a lot of hope. Um, Rio in the 1800s, uh, they had transformed almost all of the native forests uh, in, in the kind of mountains in Rio into coffee plantations. And the emperor of Brazil at that time uh, thought it, it was a travesty and he decided to cut down all the coffee plantations and bring back native plants. And Rio has now one of the largest urban rainforests in the world. I got to live there and went to school near the forest and we'd see toucans and monkeys, there's sloths that still live there, quatimundis, this amazing biodiversity. So we have the capacity with the political will to do the right things to save places, not just on our own planet but also <laughs> in outer space and the moon. Um, it's just about how many of us mobilize and put pressure on our leaders to do the right things. Great place for us to end. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. It's been uh, terrific. Our speaker today has been Sebastian Nichols, Oceans Associate with the California uh, Environmental Association. And uh, you're very, we re really appreciate your work, your good effort. With that, meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks. Our pleasure. Great.